So in this example, we are actually going to implement the taxi queuing system, the full-blown taxi queuing system. So this is, think of a situation where, you know, taxis are arriving uh, and departing at different times, maybe at a train station, and we want to maintain a queue of these taxis, and the queue has the usual expected, you know, properties, that the taxi that came earliest will be at the front of the queue, and this will be the taxi that will be dispatched next. The taxi that came latest will join the queue at the end, and it will stay in the queue until it reaches the front and is dispatched. Okay, so this is about structures and pointers. So of course, all of you know this, that memory is, uh, you know, every location of memory has an address and it stores one byte. And every program that is run is allocated some chunk of memory, which is divided into stack segment, data segment, and code segment. And so here, uh, I have a simple program in which there is a structure, my struct type, which has a character member and two integer members. And then I've declared two local variables, p1 and a. p1 is of type my struct type and a is integer. So since both p1 and a are local variables, space for them will be allocated in the stack segment, right? In the activation record of main. So, and for a, we will allocate four bytes of storage because it, an integer requires 32 bits. So in the stack segment, I'll have four bytes for A. So how many bytes would I need for P1? P1 needs to store, P1 is an object of my struct type. So it, it needs uh, an integer, it needs two integers and a character. So that is, each integer requires four bytes. So it is eight bytes plus character requires one byte. So it is one byte plus four bytes plus four bytes. So that's nine bytes of storage. And in memory, it would look something like this, that, uh, you know, the, in the storage allocated for P1, there would be one byte reserved for the member named Z, four bytes reserved for the member named X, and similarly four bytes for the member named Y. However, if you notice that in this brace I have put here, I have allowed some gap here, and if you're wondering why did I allow that gap, we'll just see that in a minute. So this is just saying that local variables uh, are allocated space in the stack, which we just discussed. But here, when you're looking at the space allocated for P1, which is of my struct type, you know, this has three members, Z, X, and Y. Now, although most compilers will actually do this, it will allocate the first byte for Z, the next four bytes for X, and the next four bytes for Y. Most compilers will do this because that's perhaps the natural way to to allocate the memory, but the C++ standard does not require the compiler to do this. For example, the C++ standard says that if the compiler wants, it can put Y first, then Z, and then X. Okay, so you should not make any assumptions about the relative layout of the different members within the memory allocated for the structure. You should not assume that the first byte is indeed Z, and then the next four bytes are X, or so on. If you want to access a member within a structure, use the dot p1.x or p1.y, okay? Similarly, you know, here some nine bytes have been allocated for the structure, and one might say, you know, why is this brace not ending here at the end of the ninth byte? And this is because C++ standard allows the compiler to put some padding depending on the machine architecture. So for example, it, it is possible that your compiler is actually storing maybe instead of nine bytes, it's actually reserving 12 bytes, of which three bytes are unused, okay? So it, it can provide some padding. The standard actually does not even specify where you put the padding, at the beginning or at the end or in the middle. So for example, here I've shown the padding at the end. It could have come in the middle like this. So you should not make, make any assumptions about within the memory allocated for a structure, where exactly is your particular data member? because it depends on the relative layout, it depends on what padding the compiler has put, and the standard allows all of these, okay? So it's, you should not make any such assumptions. You should access the members only through the specific operators, like dot operator used to access the members, okay? However, all the four bytes allocated for a particular integer member will be contiguous. It's not that the four bytes allocated for p1.x will themselves have some padding between them. So that will be treated as an integer. However, between x and y, there could be padding. y could appear before x in the layout and so on. Okay, 
uh, and uh, I mean all of you would recall the ampersand and star operators for getting the address of a variable and for dereferencing an address. So we can use exactly the same thing for structures. For example, here I have shown a program where I am using the ampersand and star operator on integers and integer pointers. Here is an analogous program where I have defined a structure, I have declared a variable of that structure and this is a variable whose type is pointer to that structure. Just like I can have pointed to an integer, I can also have pointed to a structure. Okay? And just like I can take the address of an integer variable and put it in a variable whose type is int star, so I can take the address of a variable of type my struct type and put it in a variable whose type is my struct type star. Right? And then uh, I can dereference star pointer pt1. Uh, since pointer p1 is of type my struct type star, so star pointer p1 would be an object of type my struct type and therefore I can initialize it just like the way I would initialize any object of type my struct type. Yeah, this is, so this is exactly parallel to what we do over here with the basic data types like integer float character and so on except that we are now talking about user defined types rather than the primitive data types given by the language. Right? I mean exactly the same, no change at all. So if you have understood ampersand and star for the basic data types, this is exactly the same. There is no difference. Okay, so this we have already just discussed. Okay, so can we access the individual members through pointers? So for example, I know that star ptr1 accesses the object whose address is given by ptr p1 and it accesses this object as an object of type my struct type. Right? But suppose I wanted access to a specific member of that object, let us say x or y. So I could of course say star ptr p1 dot x, star ptr p1 dot y because star ptr p1 is giving me access to that entire object. So then I could use dot x dot y and this is correct, this is fine. However, uh, C++ provides an additional operator called the arrow operator for uh, these kinds of situations. So basically instead of saying star ptr p1 dot x, I could say ptr p1 arrow x. What this arrow says is you first dereference the thing to the left of it and after you have dereferenced you access the member named x. Okay? So ptr p1 arrow x means dereference ptr p1 and then access the member named x which is exactly the same as star ptr p1 dot x. So basically these two things are the same. Pointer variable arrow member name is equivalent to star pointer variable dot member name. However, the arrow operator can only be used with a pointer to a structure, right? whereas the dot is used with an object of that structure, with a variable of that structure. right? So that is the only difference. So here I have shown some simple examples where I could initialize star pointer pt1 with pointer p1 which is the entire object directly like this or I could say pointer p1 arrow z is c, pointer p1 arrow x is 2 pointer p1 arrow y is 3 and so on. Right? Similarly, I could write this or I could say pointer p1 arrow x is 1 plus pointer p1 arrow y. So they are two completely functionally equivalent programs. Okay. okay, so are there any doubts about this? You had some question here. So this is dependent on the architecture of the computer that you know you are using, more specifically on the architecture of the memory that you are using. Right? So, there are processors which can access memory only at addresses which are multiples of 4. But, you know, there, there one can think of other processors. For example, uh, I mean the C++ language can also be used for what are called embedded processors. These are processors that go inside your mobile phone or, you know, go inside small gadgets. And their memory is very, very expensive. You cannot waste memory. So those processors will allow you to access memory at any particular address. Right? So that depends on that memory architecture. So, so that's why you know, when you are programming, you should not make any assumption that, the, that there is some padding to align it with a multiple of 4 or there is no padding. Because it depends on what processor you are running, what compiler you are using, what memory architecture. So as a programmer, you don't want to bother about that. Yeah, so, so you are right. And some, some cases the addresses need to be multiples of 4, but not in all cases. There are processes which do not require that. So let us go to the next one. Okay. 
Okay, so this is continuing our discussion on structures and pointers. So here is, uh, you know, a simple example of a, I mean, we will actually build more on this example in the next set of slides that I'll show. But suppose I'm trying to implement a taxi queuing system. Once again, this is inspired by some examples in Professor Ranade's book. So here I've defined two structures, one to store information about the driver, the other to store information about a taxi. So a driver has a name which is a character array and there is presumably an integer ID for the driver. A taxi has an integer ID and the driver for the taxi can keep changing so we do not fix the driver with the taxi. We sort of allow a pointer to a driver object to be present here so that if the driver changes I can just change that pointer. Okay. And then I have declared two variables. Both of these are local variables in the function main. One is of type driver, the other is of type taxi. So, you know, how much space will I require for this structure taxi? ID is an integer, requires 4 bytes. DRV is a pointer to the structure driver, right? So, pointer is just an address in memory. And if we assume that our memory requires 32 bits of address, then whether it's a pointer to integer or pointer to float or pointer to driver, all of them are just addresses. So, they will just require 32 bits, 4 bytes. So, here I require 4 bytes plus 4 bytes, 8 bytes for an object of type taxi. And so, uh, you know, when I, so this being a local variable, d1 being a local variable of main, space for it will be allocated in the stack segment. How much space? The structured driver has, requires 50 bytes for storing the name. Each character requires 1 byte and 4 bytes, right? So here I've tried to depict here, of, of course this is not to scale, but the name requires a little bit more storage, 50 bytes, than ID which requires 4 bytes, fine? And then taxi t1 is also a local variable, so it will also be allocated space in the stack segment, and this requires 4 bytes for ID and 4 bytes to store the address of a driver, right? So they are, that's kind of like this. And then suppose I have a code which says d1 is assign shaker 23. So what this will do is, this is initializing a variable of type driver. So the name member will get the value shaker, the ID member will get the value 23. And then suppose I say the ID member of T1 is assigned 12 and the DRV member of T1 is assigned the address of D1. Okay? The DRV member is of type driver star, so it can take the address of an object of type driver. So D1 is an object of type driver, so it can take the address of T1. And what do we mean by the address? It's once again the address of the starting byte, right? So let us say that is 230 in hex, so we'll get 230 over here. Now, you know, from now onwards, we'll actually have a lot of occasion to talk about some member of a structure containing the address of some other structure just like we have here, right? This DRV is a member of this structure containing the address of another structure. And instead of sort of writing the address here and then copying that address there, and then sort of carefully looking at it and figuring out that uh -huh, this is really the address of that, what we will do is we will often use just this more convenient notation. We'll put an arrow like this from here to here, saying that this is really pointing to that there, right? Which means that DRV has the address of d1, t1 dot drv has the address of d1. So we will use this notation quite frequently. So uh, now what we want to have is we want to implement a queue of taxis. So we want one taxi to point to the next taxi and then that taxi to point to the next taxi or one taxi, fr from one taxi I should be able to get information about the next taxi so that we can have a queue. Now how could we do this? Could we do it like this that uh, this is the struct link taxi has the ID and the driver pointer, but can I put next and can I put a link taxi over there? So this will have the same problem that we discussed earlier, that the storage required for this would be some 8 bytes for this and the storage required for link taxi, which will again require 8 bytes for this and the storage required for another link taxi. And that's will, that will continue forever, right? So we cannot do this because it would require infinite storage. So then how are, how are we going to have one taxi sort of allow us access to the information about the next taxi. So one easy way of doing this is to actually have, instead of saying 
that I'm going to actually have a copy of the next taxi structure, let me have a pointer to the next taxi, right? So here what I have done is, in the link taxi structure, I have the ID and the driver pointer as earlier, but instead of next being the link taxi itself, now I've made next a pointer to the linked taxi. So the type of next is link taxi star, okay? And this does not have a problem because they said it does not matter it's a pointer to what, it requires just four bytes. A pointer is just an address, okay? So here the total number of bytes required is four plus four plus four, that's 12, unlike the previous case where I required infinite storage, fine? So now what I could do is I could have a program like this where I'm saying that the driver is the same structure as before. Link taxi is what we just saw. It has a member next, which is a pointer to the next link taxi. And suppose I have two variables D1 and D2 of type driver, so they will be allocated space on the stack segment. And then I have two variables T1 and T2 of type taxi, they will also be allocated space on the stack segment. And then I initialize D1 with shaker 23, so that's what happens here. D2 with Abdul 34, so that's what happens here in the space for D2. And then I say T1.ID is 12, T1.DRV is the address of D1, so that's this arrow notation I'm using here. So T1.DRV is pointing to D1, which means it has the address of D1. And T1.next is null, so the next is 0. And then I say T2.ID is 11, T2.DRV is ampersand D2. So t2.drv is pointing to d2 and t2.next is ampersand t1, right? Link taxi next is of type link taxi pointer. So t1 is an object of type link taxi. So ampersand t1 will be link taxi pointer. So I can assign that to t2.next, right? So now you have this situation where in t2, there is this pointer pointing here and then there is this pointer pointing there. And now I could ask, uh, can we print out t2.next arrow drv arrow name? So what does this mean? It means go to t2, access the next member, dereference that, then access the drv member, right? The arrow means dereference the left hand side, then access the member on the right hand side. So t2.next is here, dereference that, so go to wherever it's pointing, then access the member named drv. But then there is one more arrow, so dereference that, go to where it is pointing and access the member named name, right? So that gives us shaker. Okay, and uh, we have also used new and delete with basic data types like integer, float, character and so on. We can use the same things here. So for example, I could say new driver, which will allocate an object of type driver on the heap dynamically and it will return a pointer to that or I could similarly allocate an array of drivers. So this is just like allocating an array of integers, right? So if it was an array of integers, I would say new int 2, here I'm saying new driver 2 because driver is my uh, user defined data type. So this will allocate space for an array of two elements where each element is of type driver and will return a pointer to the first element to my DRV array. And similarly like delete, Right? If you want to say delete my DRV pointer, then it will see wherever it's pointing to in the heap and it will delete that. And if you say delete an array, it will delete the entire array. So this is just like what we did for basic data types, except now we are doing it for structures. Right? So this is the nice part that if you have understood things for the basic data types, understanding it for structures is the same. There is no additional effort required. Okay? And of course, you have to be careful about the usual things that if you're that new may not return successfully. So if after you have dynamically allocated something and before you are dereferencing that address, you should check whether that's not null. And if it is null, maybe you should print out an error message saying that memory allocation has failed. And similarly, when you are trying to delete something, you must first check that it is not null and then delete that. So this is the usual thing which we had for pointers to basic data types also. So now what we'll do is we'll just look at an example which applies all of these things that we have just studied. Right? So in this example, we are actually going to implement the taxi queuing system, the full-blown taxi queuing system. So this is, think of a situation where, you know, taxis are arriving uh, and departing at different times, maybe at a train station, and we want to maintain a queue of these taxis, and the queue has the usual expected, you know, properties. 
that the taxi that came earliest will be at the front of the queue and this will be the taxi that will be dispatched next. The taxi that came latest will join the queue at the end and it will stay in the queue until it reaches the front and is dispatched. This is what you would expect in a taxi queue. So here is how uh, I can sort of implement it. So these are the different structures I'm going to use, the driver and the link taxi that we've already seen. Instead of a character array, I've used the data type string here, which we had mentioned, I think in the second or third lecture of the course. But if you're more comfortable with character arrays, you can also use character arrays. This is just for some convenience, I've used string there. The link taxi structure is exactly the same as we had seen. It has a pointer to the next taxi. And Q is going to be a structure which has a pointer to the front and end of the queue because I need to dispatch taxis from the front and I need to add taxis, new taxis at the end. So I need to know where the front and end of the queue are. And it also contains a count of the number of taxis in the queue. And so note that all of these structure definitions are before the functions that use them. And of course, outside the functions because they're going to be used in multiple functions. Okay, this is the string then. And now here is the main function. It allocates an object Q of the type Q. And to begin with, the queue is empty. So we denote that by saying both the front and end are null and the number of taxis is zero. Okay. So note that I'm accessing the members through the dot operator because I'm directly using an object of type Q, not a pointer to object of type Q. Right? And then here is a simple loop. So you know, suppose this program is running at the counter from where taxis are being dispatched. So at the counter, perhaps there is an operator who is giving in different commands to maintain the queue. So what are the commands? If a new taxi has come to join the queue, so J, a new passenger has come to take a taxi from the queue, so the dispatch or you exit. And then this is fairly simple. I'm reading in the command and then using a switch case statement. If the command is to join, I will execute the code to add a newly arrived taxi at the end of the queue. If the command is to dispatch, I'll dispatch the taxi at the front of the queue, otherwise I'll exit. And then, you know, although this is a while true loop, looks like an infinite loop, but really by typing X, you can exit from this loop and also exit from the program. So that's straightforward. So now let's look at the code for adding a taxi at the end of the queue and for dispatching a taxi from the front of the queue. So this is adding a taxi at the end of the queue, right? So a new taxi has come, it has to be added at the end of the queue. So I first allocate an object of type driver. And then of course, if that allocation failed, I print out this and return minus one. Otherwise I read in the name of the driver, read in the name of, read in the ID of the driver. Okay. A driver has a name and an ID. Then I allocate an object of type link taxi and then make the DRV member of new taxi, which is a pointer to the driver, right? So I make it point to whatever this new driver I had allocated. I, I make the DRV member point to that. I make the next member point to null because this is going to be the last taxi in the queue. So it's at, after it, there is nothing. And then I read in the ID of the taxi. And then I have to now add it to the queue, right? So how do I add it to the queue? So there are two cases. One is the, if the queue is empty and the other is if the queue is non-empty. So if the queue is empty, it means both front and end were null. So if that is the case, I'm just going to add this taxi and this will be the only taxi in the queue now because the queue was empty and now I'm adding a taxi to the queue, right? So if it's the only taxi in the queue, I make both front and end point to this taxi. I update the number of taxis in the queue to one and that is it. So from an empty queue, now I've gone to a queue with one taxi, right? Is that clear? So this is the simpler case, how to add a taxi to a queue which was empty. The other case is when the queue was non-empty. So let's say the queue already had a blue taxi and a red taxi. The blue taxi was the front, the red taxi was at the end. And of course, the next of the blue taxi is pointing to the red taxi, the next of the red taxi is pointing to null. And now here is this new yellow taxi that has come, which has to be added at the end of the queue. So what do we need to do to add it at the end of the queue? The red taxi's next pointer should point here and Q dot end should point here, right? So that's what we'll do. The red taxi's next pointer should point here and Q dot end should point here, which means whatever was Q dot end earlier, its next member should point to new taxi and then Q dot end should itself point to new taxi, right? So that's exactly what we have done. Q dot ends next member should point to new taxi 
and q dot n should itself point to new taxi. Okay. So note here I have used a dot here because q is an object of type q. So to access a member I can use dot but the end member of q is a pointer to the link taxi. So then to access its next member I have to use the arrow. Right? Q is an object so I can directly use q dot end but q dot end is a pointer so I have to use the arrow over there. Okay? And I increase the number of taxis. So that is how we add a taxi at the end of the queue. How do we remove a taxi, dispatch a taxi from the front of the queue? We first figure out what is the taxi at the front of the queue. So dispatch taxi is queue dot front and uh, of course first we check whether there are any taxis in the queue at all. If there are no taxis then we can't, we can't do anything. Otherwise we take the taxi at the front of the queue and if this was the only taxi in the queue which means if queue dot front was equal to queue dot end then after we dispatch this taxi the queue is going to become empty. So we have to sort of reflect that. So both front and end become null and num taxi is 0. So this is the simple case. If there was only one taxi in the queue, you dispatch it and the queue becomes empty. Otherwise what happens is there are already three taxis in the queue, the blue, red and yellow and I want to dispatch this one at the front. right? So after I have dispatched this, queue dot front should point here. So that is what I am going to do. I will say q dot front should point to the next of whatever q dot front was pointing earlier. Right? q dot front was pointing here. So the next, so q dot front should now point to wherever q dot front is pointing and where next of that is pointing. And I decrease the number of taxis and then I have to sort of get rid of this dispatch taxi from the, you know, I mean this is no longer needed, this taxi is now dispatched. So I can free up this memory, this was dynamically allocated when the blue taxi had joined the queue. So now I can free up that memory. So I say that well, you know, I am dispatching this taxi and then I want to delete dispatch taxi but remember this dispatch taxi itself has a pointer to a dynamically allocated driver object. So when I free up the taxi I should also free up the driver object. So that is what we do for the driver object free up the memory for the taxi. So that is what this was about.